International Raceway to County Line Road and from Fort Carson Route 1 East to I-25. We also want to let you know that we're anticipating a press briefing at uh, Pikes Peak International Raceway in about 15 minutes. We'll bring you that live, but first of all, we want to check in with our Bill Folsom. He's been covering this since the beginning. Uh, Bill, we understand more air support being brought in. What are you seeing? Where are you right now in relation to the fire? Yeah, well, we have been seeing a lot of air support. Most of it, what we're seeing is Fort Carson helicopters. They've got the Apaches. They've also got that big double rotor Chinook going. It's amazing to watch it come and go, and the huge amount of water is picking up. Where we're located, we are seeing they're picking up water right over that ridge uh, uh, where that fire truck is going by. They were just here a moment ago. They pick up, they go. It takes about five minutes to load, and then they're going out and dropping. The huge challenge today has been with the wind. Uh, if people were with us earlier, and as you know, we're Robin Elizabeth, I was up just on the other side of that hill and flames came over, forced us to evacuate. We watched them go at incredible speed. Uh, it took only minutes for them to come over a ridge and then be in a dangerously close to us. So we had to pick up and move down here. In fact, uh, firefighters stopped and asked us to move. And I know several of my colleagues today have been asked to move several times. This uh, fire has been uh, started on Fort Carson and then has been moving east towards I-25. It has burned thousands of acres. Um, it's moving so fast they're having a hard time nailing down exactly how much. We're hearing reports anywhere from two to 4,000 acres, and that will come as uh, the evening goes on. Multiple agencies here. Fort Carson's got the lead, but they have help from Colorado Springs Fire, Hanover Fire, El Paso County Fire. Uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of fire trucks out here challenge for them though is they're having to work on the sides of this fire it has been moving so fast that uh, they can't get in front of it and it goes over ridges and it'll be over in an area faster than you can even move a truck in for their own safety they have had to stay out of the way so we have moved down here along i-25 we're watching smoke go out across eastern el paso county so for anybody who is concerned with smoke coming your way flames have not gone past i-25 they're really, this is the landfill here down at Midway. All the flames are on that side. The other big challenge that has been happening, if you can see, you've got a plume of smoke here, a plume of smoke here, and then another one up here right below the sun, which tells you that this fire has broken into fingers. This is going multiple directions. So trying to pick a place to you know, fight the fire, they can't do that. They have to have all these multiple agencies uh, picking different spots. We're also seeing Sheriff's deputies coming and going from this area. They've been up making sure that people are evacuated and safe and uh, a lot of activity going on with that. So for now, we're seeing the wind die down a little bit, but there still is wind, so still quite a bit of challenge going on. This has been going on since this morning. A very long firefight going on, and it is not over with yet. Watching out for you, El Paso County, Bill Folsom, News 5. Bill, thanks. Take a look. Some new video into News 5 from the Colorado Springs Fire Department, one of many crews on scene helping out. This is uh, performing structure protection earlier this afternoon with El Paso and Pueblo County fire crews. Late this afternoon, El Paso County ordered fire restrictions for all unincorporated parts of the county. Also, Manitou Springs has implemented those same restrictions. That means no open burning, expect uh, no open burning expected any develop all other than in developed campgrounds and grills. So again, no outdoor smoking. Make sure to properly dispose of cigarette butts, please. That is so important. But again, stage one fire restrictions in unincorporated El Paso County and Manitou Springs. And that plume from the smoke, so large, we were able to catch it on our News 5 radar. Take a look, that big dot of green is not precipitation, but it's, instead that's the smoke heading to the southeast that you're seeing. The State Department of Public Health and Environment has issued an air quality health advisory, meaning those with respiratory illnesses, also the young and the elderly should stay indoors, keep those windows closed. A reminder, we're waiting on a news conference to update the latest information on the firefight that's coming up at about 6.15, uh, give or take. Right now, let's head to lead forecaster Mike Daniels. Mike. 
The weather's still the X factor here tonight. No doubt about that, Rob. It's almost impossible to fight a fire when winds are as strong as they have been today. We've had gusts from 45 to 55 miles per hour, and Midway is in a unique position because they're right in between gaps in mountain ranges, and that wind just funnels down that little gap and just creates some very strong, ferocious wind. If you've ever driven on I-25 between Colorado Springs and Pueblo when a westerly flow was prevailing, you know what I'm talking about. You hit that area, and that wind just kicks in dramatically. Right now, wind speed's starting to calm down a little. Still gusty in most areas. Fort Carson, a westerly gust at 24 miles per hour. Pueblo sustained out of the northwest at 20 miles per hour, but that wind is going to gradually die off here within the next couple of hours. The other key component is the lack of humidity. It is just bone dry out there, so you combine the humidity, the tinder dry fuels around here, and that strong wind. Conditions were just perfect for a fire today, and as I told you last night, if a fire would start, it would burn out of control very quickly, and unfortunately, that was the case. Wind speeds. Here's the forecast. At 7 o'clock tonight, once the sun sets, we're going to see things stabilize a, a bit. Those winds are really going to start to lay down. Overnight tonight, the wind is not going to be a problem. Even in that area around Midway, you're not going to see any strong wind. That's certainly going to help firefighters get a good handle on this fire. Tomorrow morning, mainly calm conditions early. As we work later into the morning, the winds typically start to intensify just a little bit. And by mid to late afternoon, we'll have winds out of the south tomorrow, anywhere from 10 to 20 and even 25 miles per hour. That's pretty tame compared to what we've been dealing with today here across our area. Relative humidity also coming up after sunset. This is 8 o'clock, still on the dry side, but by 11 o'clock we've got quite a bit of moisture in the atmosphere that gets even higher overnight tonight and early tomorrow morning. Then, of course, we'll start to dry out again tomorrow afternoon, but again, it won't be as dry tomorrow as what we're dealing with out there right now. Please keep in mind the red flag warning active until 7 o'clock tonight. I don't think we'll meet red flag criteria across El Paso County or Pueblo County tomorrow, but nonetheless, fire danger is still going to be sky Sky high around here until we get some moisture, and I am looking at a system that promises moisture around here by Sunday. More on that coming up. Boy, do we need it, Mike. Thanks again. Those stage one restrictions on incorporated El Paso County and Manitou. With hundreds of homes now under those evacuation orders, there is help tonight. Yes, News 5's Jessica Barreto. She's live at a church in Fountain that is helping people tonight. Jessica. And part of that help has come in the form of food. Now, as you can see, there's pizza laid out, there's juice, Girl Scout cookies, water. Most of these are actually donations. And all are meant to just give these families who had to evacuate just a little bit of comfort as they wrap up their long day. Now, earlier today, I caught up with a family who had to evacuate out of Midway Ranches. Take a listen to what they had to tell me about their ordeal. So we, we got in our truck and we left. We proceeded uh, north on Young Hollow Road, and as we were going north, the fire jumped across the other side of the road, and then the fire department told us we had to turn back and go in the opposite direction. Now, Red Cross organizers say this location will be open as a shelter for whoever needs it. They will set up a cot if necessary and provide a toiletry kit. And families I've talked to all day are just really concerned and distraught about the safety of their homes, their animals. I mean, they had to leave these things behind and just, you know, hope for the best. And, of course, all of those answers, all of those questions still remain unanswered. Always watching out for you in Fountain, Jessica Barreto, News 5. Jessica, thank you. And the Colorado State Fairgrounds opened up for the large animals right. and Pueblo Animal Services also taking in your small pets, your cats and dogs. Now we want to show you some viewer photos from the fire and again uh, just to start here uh, Carol sent this one in and we really appreciate the help we've received on social media as always and you can see uh, this is in the early stages of that fire as you can see starting to uh, rise some of that lighter smoke there. And we have one from Mike as well the smoke visible from his house which is about a half mile south of Highway 50. You can just see that plume. And we, this, an, another one from a Michael. He is located off Uinta Street in the Springs. Thank you, Mike and Michael, and everyone for sending in your pictures helping us tell this story. Yeah, that was the early stages of that fire mm -hmm. when it was just the white smoke and most of that grass and uh, other types of shrub was burning. But then as the fire built through the day, and sadly, some of those structures and homes actually were destroyed. We saw that thick black and brown smoke mm -hmm. signifying that yeah, this is a lot more serious than initially thought. But again, we are waiting to hear from uh, some of those fire commanders in about uh, five minutes or so to give us an update. And of course, you can always send us your photos of any breaking news situation. Share them on our Facebook and on our Twitter pages. And make sure to download the KOAA News 5 app. We'll make sure to keep you updated 
on this breaking news situation. We'll be able to send us news tips. We can upload your photos as well. But the bottom line is we have the information you need at your fingertips in an instant about what is changing in this particular breaking news situation. And we are waiting for that press conference in just about four or five minutes. So stay tuned for that. Still ahead also, the Broncos make it official to Mile High City. Welcoming in Case Keenum, the new QB. Find out what he has to say about the move. We have a complete wrap-up for you from Dove Valley. Plus, we're going to head to Florida. Crews still continuing to dig through that debris after the pedestrian bridge collapsed in Florida. Uh, the death toll rising today. We've got the latest still ahead. Welcome back. We continue to monitor the Carson Midway fire. We're going to hear from fire commanders here in just a couple of minutes. But in the meantime, a new quarterback in Broncos country, Case Keenum, officially introduced to the media this morning. Our Matt Pritchard, he was in Dove Valley. And uh, tell us, he's excited, right? Absolutely. And all of us are, too. Some excitement, some optimism, some hope. Back at Dove Valley after that 5-11 and season is finally the Broncos have a starting quarterback. It's been tough watching the carousel turn over the last few years and never seeing any improvement, but John Elway and his staff believe Keenum is the answer they've been looking for. From the get-go, Case was their target, and he told the media today that feeling was mutual from the start of his search. You know, we didn't wait around. Uh, we made it happen. You know, Denver was, was number one on my list, too, so, um, you know, it's been an incredible welcome here. Uh, it's been it's been uh, such a such a whirlwind of a couple of days, but we have my wife and I, Kimberly, uh, we felt right at home. Now, not to bring the mood down, but this definitely doesn't solve all the Broncos' problems heading into 2018. Coming up a little later in sports, if we have the time, we'll hear from John Elway and what he hopes to accomplish during the rest of free agency and into the draft later on in April, guys. Matt, thanks. And again, we continue to monitor that huge grass fire burning in the Midway Ranch area. Evacuations in effect. Uh, within minutes, we hope, we're going to hear from those fire commanders. Fort Carson is the incident command. Hear from them about where they stand in terms of this firefight right now. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back.
clear skies in Colorado Springs, not suffering from that snow smoke plume because the wind is blowing from northwest to southeast, pushing that smoke plume right between Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Pueblo is still mostly clear right now. If you look very closely above the buildings on the top left of your screen, though, you can see a little bit of that smoke from the fire pushing off to the southeast. Here's how dry it's been around here this month in Colorado Springs. Most neighborhoods got a nice soaking last night. It amounted to about 12 hundredths of an inch of water. That's the only precip so far this month. And please keep in mind, March is usually the snowiest month of the entire year in Colorado Springs. Pueblo, not a drop of water so far this month. Here's what the wind is doing right now. Sustained in the springs, northwest at 15, Fort Carson west at 18 miles per hour. In Pueblo, the wind not quite as strong as what you had to deal with earlier, sustained out of the northwest at 20 miles per hour. Everyone will start to see that wind die down here within the next hour or two. Humidity also just dangerously dry. The recipe for fire, very low humidity, bone dry fuels. We've got that and the strong gusty wind we've had throughout the day today. That's why it's been so hard for the firefighters to even try to tackle that fire. The wind's just blowing it too fast. Very dangerous situation. Seven o'clock tonight, wind starting to die down all across the News 5 viewing area. Late tonight, we'll have just a light breeze or calm conditions. That will help tremendously with the firefight. Early tomorrow morning, calm winds. Late morning, we'll start to see things ramp up a little between Colorado Springs and Pueblo, but certainly nothing close to the wind that we've had to deal with through today. By mid to late afternoon, we'll have south to southwesterly winds from 15 to occasionally 20 miles per hour. Then the wind will again die off late tomorrow night. Wanted to show you that smoke plume. It has really pushed off to the east very quickly. That smoke plume stretching all the way out to close to the Kansas border. You can see it out around the Los Animas area, so the wind has blown that smoke plume 85 miles so far this afternoon. Here's your hour-by-hour -hour forecast. Tomorrow, plenty of sunshine as we work through your St. Patrick's Day. See a few high, thin clouds, I think, from time to time. Sunday's our big day of interest, though, because as I told you last night, we're tracking a storm system that has the potential to bring some good, uh, beneficial precipitation to our area. Previous storms, most of the winter, have been tracking too far to the north. This one looks like it's going to track across the Colorado New Mexico border, prime position to bring at least parts of the viewing area, some beneficial moisture. This is Sunday afternoon, 5 to 5.30, starting to see rain across northern El Paso County, snow in Teller County, colder air mixing in. This is 7 to 7.30 Sunday night, starting to see some good bands of snow work over Monument Hill into northern El Paso County. You can see the heaviest snow uh, hugging the Palmer Divide. That snow will gradually push from north to south. Here's why I'm not real optimistic of a lot of snow moving into Colorado Springs and Pueblo. We'll have a northerly wind. It will be strong and gusty. That will cause blow snow across northern El Paso County, but as that wind comes down the Palmer Divide, it dries the air out, so uh, that storm is going to have to overcome those strong northerly winds across Colorado Springs and Pueblo, but at least a chance now for most parts of the viewing area to at least get some precipitation late Sunday night into Monday morning. Here's how bad that wind was today in the springs. A gust at 53. Pueblo came in at 49 miles per hour, again gradually tapering off here within the next couple of hours. That wind pushed the high in the springs today to 57. Pueblo came in with a high of 66 degrees. Outside right now, we've got temperatures 40s, 50s, and 60s, the warmest air out along the Arkansas River Valley. Low temperatures tonight, below freezing everywhere, 28 in the springs. Pueblo dropping down to 27 degrees. We'll have mostly clear skies throughout the night. Not a bad St. Paddy's Day at all. Temperatures tomorrow, 50s and 60s all across southeastern Colorado. And the best news I've got for you, the wind not strong at all, not near as close as what we've had to deal with today. I think some of the stronger winds will be across El Paso County from Colorado Springs out east across rural eastern El Paso County. In Colorado Springs, we're going to see clouds thicken and lower on Sunday. It's going to be breezy to windy. As that front blows through, the wind is going to switch to the north, bringing in that colder air. 53 early in the day, and then rain changing to snow. Late Sunday afternoon through Sunday night into early Monday morning. A chilly day on Monday, but look out. My big, uh, my big first alert five right now is warning you about the potential for seeing blowing snow across northern El Paso County Sunday afternoon. But more than likely Sunday night. That's, I think, the prime target at this point. Storm is still a long way off. We'll pin that thing down for you as you watch during the day tomorrow. In Pueblo, afternoon highs gradually falling off over the next few days. Finally, at least a chance of getting some March moisture late Sunday night into very early Monday morning. A cool day on Monday, then you're gradually ramping back up to 70 degrees by Thursday. And I hope we get some moisture in Pueblo with that storm late Sunday night into Monday morning because after that, it's just back to plain old dry. For Canyon City, I've got showers in 
your forecast late Sunday night into early Monday morning. Chilly day for you on Monday, and then temperatures gradually warm up into the upper 60s by Thursday. And for Woodland Park, finally some snow for you. It could be a wet, heavy snow starting Sunday afternoon, continuing through Sunday night, finally wrapping up probably before sunrise Monday morning. Let's hope it happens. Bone dry up there as well. Time for traffic on News 5. There's a crash in the Springs. Right lane is blocked on Fillmore. That's westbound at I-25. Still trying to clean up a big accident further south. This one on I-25 northbound at Cimarron. Slow and go all the way back to Tejon. Guys. Mike, thanks. A live look tonight in southern El Paso County. Again, that fire continues to burn, awaiting a news conference. We do know that El Paso County Sheriff Bill Elder is there. The Red Cross is represented. Not sure if Fort Carson is weighing in. We hope so. They are the incident commander on this situation tonight. Again, more on the firefight straight ahead on News 5 at 6. Nineties had her ranch. They had 80 acres too, but just an absolutely frightening situation. She didn't know where her husband was when the first flames were breaking out when the incident command post was still over at Hanover Station 3. Uh, so you can imagine just the amount of stress that she has undergone shortly after we talked to her. Thankfully, though, she did find her husband. But that, that's really just a little anecdote, a little example of just the amount of stress, the just panic and heartbreak these people are dealing with. Obviously, uh, many of their homes um, kind of being 
you know, threatened uh, as far as the day goes. So we're still waiting uh, for the official word from firefighters, from fire officials. But yeah, a long day for uh, these people that live here. And hopefully, um, you know, for some of them, they can go back, uh, whether it's today, tomorrow, the next few days, and hopefully still see their house standing. Rob Elizabeth, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, and again. The house has been burnt to the ground. Oh my God. I'm so sorry, Mark. I'm so sorry. Boy, that is tough. That's some of the heartbreak we've seen all afternoon from the folks that we've encountered who have been evacuated. You can see that thick black smoke. And again, uh, in the path of that fire, some homes destroyed. No number quite yet. Our crew is seeing those folks reeling today, though. Emergency responders working as hard as they can right now to try and get some type of containment line. And these families are just frantic. There's, we've seen families separated. Uh, there is a shelter where everyone can go, Fountain Valley Baptist Church in Fountain. Also, they can take their animals to the Colorado State Fairgrounds, Pueblo Animal Services. So there is help out there for them. But what a difficult, difficult day for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And, and behind uh, Sam's live shot there, it looked like some of the fire commanders were moving into that location where they were still awaiting this news conference to give us an update and, more importantly, information for those folks who have been forced for their homes. Right. Still monitoring that. We'll be back right after this break. It is really north and south. It's kind of in a big rectangular area, if you will, a couple hundred meters north-south and then a, a little long as it moves towards I-25. But we just took a aerial uh, recon of the, the fire, if you will. And I don't think it'll reach I-25. We have some pretty good mixture of assets out there between uh, engineering type equipment like bulldozers and graders, and then we're using aviation equipment from the fort, uh, from our aviation brigade to use our Bambi buckets again to drop water on the fire. And then we've also had some fixed wing assets uh, out here more recently dropping some fire retardant uh, as well to, to prevent it from growing much further. As well, uh, you can look at what the job that was done out here today uh, by all the, uh, the really the great cooperation again that we have amongst the two counties and the, and the Fort Carson assets and all the local agencies that are participating. Really did a fantastic job evacuating people as a precautionary member and then really looking at some of the structure protection that was done here today. You could really see it, how well it was done, that structure protection from the air that we just uh, went up and looked at. Um, we know we, there were several structures lost. Um, don't have too many details on the impact of what that was right now, but we're not tracking, tracking any loss of life or injury uh, at this time, which is you know, the thing that we're looking forward uh, to protect the most. And so pending any questions that you all may have, uh, that was kind of the update I had at this time. Which one? The fire that began on Fort Carson. So we are in the midst of, uh, as, as most of you are aware, this is a heavy deployment year uh, for Fort Carson. We just recently sent a brigade uh, to Afghanistan. In about another four weeks, we're going to send another brigade to Afghanistan. And then we're also preparing uh, for future deployments that we don't have orders yet for, but that we do expect they're going to be coming by summer. 
Uh, and so we're in a continuous training cycle up until those deployments and the soldiers actually leave to go overseas. And so they were out there doing some training today, combined training between uh, some aviation assets and some infantry. Um, and at some point, uh, we had a fire start in the vicinity of that range uh, today. I was uh, given the information that it could potentially been an M1A2 tank fire. Is that accurate? Do you know? uh, no, I don't believe so. Because the, the, where the range was, uh, it was mostly infantry, and they would not be out there with tanks. So do you guys do the same training regardless of what the conditions are? Or? So we, because of the deployment cycle, uh, like it's red flag conditions. Uh, you know, currently we're in that high fire danger area. Um, we have to train uh, in order to prepare those soldiers uh, to go in some of those dangerous situations that they're going to encounter in places like mostly Afghanistan for us this year, uh, but we may expect to deploy to some other locations across the globe uh, by summer or fall. And so those have to be outside now? They absolutely have to be outside. You have to practice your proficiency on all of your weapons because those are the things that are going to save your life and the lives of your fellow soldiers, both from our country and then our allies that are over there participating with us in those uh, engagements as well. Speaking to residents here, they said that they're used to having fires in the area because of Fort Carson, but today you said several structures have been um, destroyed because of the fire. I mean, it's a red flag game. We're doing this training. We know that this training has to be done, but what about these houses being destroyed and these families that no longer have a home because of it? Yep, so we'll go back and we're going to take a look at that in conjunction with the county and the state as we look uh, to recoup uh, some of the expenses. But I would also highlight that we did have the fire re uh, flare up from yesterday's uh, fire that was down here. And so you know, it's hard to say what really caused the damage to those structures at that time. Um, and that's something that we'll go back to take a look at in conjunction with both Pueblo and El Paso County. And do you have an estimate right now on size and also containment? Sure. So we're working hard on containment. I can't give you a percentage right now. And the size that we're tracking is about 2,100 acres. I'm sorry, what's that? 2,100 acres. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Bill Elder, El Paso County Sheriff. And the, uh, like the Colonel said, we'll wait for the truck to go by. Like the Colonel said that uh, there's a, a percentage of this fire that's on Fort Carson that burned off of Fort Carson, and there's probably about 40% of it that's on in El Paso County, some that's in Pueblo County as well. Uh, the bonus to this is is the great collaboration that we've got with all of our local fire agencies as well as Fort Carson. We've, we've made some really good strides in, our, in developing relationships with everybody. Uh, the Colonel and I have had uh, some time together in the past, so we, we understood what was happening and, and it's been a good move. So uh, we think we've got a plan to attack it and get it out. We're hoping to have it out by nightfall. We've got a couple of aircraft that are a couple of heavy tankers that are coming in. We do have a uh, contract with that global super tanker, but I don't think this thing's going to be anywhere near big enough to, to need that, that kind of asset. But we've got some things in play, and the key to this is is get the fire out, and then we'll figure out the rest of it later on down the road. Chair Felder, you said this was probably the, you're hoping to have this out by tonight. We've got a lot of people out here waiting to get back to their homes. Is there right. any timetable for when this might happen? No, it's, a, it's, you know, like the Colonel said, it's a big area. It's a, it's a big area. Uh, they've spent a lot of time in the, uh, in the early, early attack to protect the structures that are there, as many structures as they can. We've also uh, evacuated personnel and livestock, and so that's taken some time as opposed to attacking the fire. Right now they've got those uh, structures, what they believe is safe at this point, and so the majority of the personnel that are assigned to this thing now are going to attack the fire line and do everything that they can to get it out. You'll see uh, a heavy tanker will come in here in a little bit and uh, drop some retardant on that will keep the fire from spreading. Uh, they're doing some back burns to burn up some of, the, some of the green fuel so that we can get this thing under control quickly. Uh, for the people who are still in the streets, specifically for those restrictions people being pushed out, we're not adding to those restrictions right now? Not yet. We, are, we, have, we have evacuations all the way up to PPIR. And uh, I can't tell you the exact southern boundary and then everything over to the interstate. We've got that pretty well cleared out, we believe. And so nobody's going to be allowed back in until we can get this thing completely knocked down. We've got, as you can see, people streaming in here. We've got a ton of assets. We've got tons of uh, equipment and water and, and retardant available. And so we'll stay on it until this thing is out. We hope to get it out before, before midnight. I haven't seen your Red Cross person behind you. They're going to talk about what they They're going to talk about the resources that we've got. Uh, for personnel that are here and where we can direct them and some of the resources that we'll use to 
replenish the, the fuels that the water, uh, the firefighters are using. So. so this is compartment fire, but you're obviously helping out. How many other people are helping in this? Is this a well, situation? Fort Carson has taken over the incident control, and we did that early on because when we did that, that put Fort Carson's resources available to fight this fire. The air attack systems, uh, there were a couple of big helicopters out here dropping buckets of water on. We did that very early on because we wanted those resources in play, and that was the way that we had to do this, was turn this fire over to Fort Carson's Incident Command. It is not necessarily being called Fort Carson's fire. We don't know where it came from. I just want to get it out. Uh, right off the top of my head, do we know how many people have been evacuated? 250 homes have been evacuated. And we don't have a better estimate right now on how many homes have been lost? No, we don't. We we did a flyover a little bit ago to assess the size of the fire and the and the direction of the burn. The problem is, is from that altitude, it's a little tough to tell where structures are. There's a significant amount of burn in there, but you can also tell where fires have burned around homes where the structures have been protected. Sure, we've got a lot of people wondering the specific location of where this burn is. Do we have any cross streets? You know, it's it's hard to say. It is. It's a very large burn area. Um, it's it's just almost impossible to tell you exactly where that is. It's it has spread because the wind was shifting so quickly. It took different paths and different directions in a multitude of different ways. Um, but I believe that they've got a fairly good control over the structures that were up in there, um, especially the ones later on. So it sounds like you're saying those structures. And there, wrong. there are structures that we have lost. I will tell you that there are structures that were early on in the in the fire in the the location they're calling Area Alpha that were lost. I can't tell you how many. Uh, that appears to me to be the biggest area of loss. But again, from that altitude, uh, it's tough to tell. But you were saying from this point on, we think we have protection around the current structures. Left. Provided we don't get a much a big change in weather, wind, those kinds of things, we think so. The cool weather will help us. We've got plenty of people out here to attack it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Bill Fortune. I'm the Public Information Officer for the American Red Cross. Uh, I'm here to tell you that we do have an evacuation center open at uh, 500 Alabama Avenue in Fountain. We have the capability of housing people overnight should that be necessary. We're also providing food for the firefighters uh, and for the clients that are there at our evacuation center. We're also providing food for the people that are down at the uh, Colorado State Fairgrounds with the large animals. Uh, we also now have two locations where people can take their small pets uh, to uh, to make sure that they're taken care of. It, it would be at no cost to the client to go and take these animals. Uh, typically, we don't allow animals in our people's shelter, and we'll continue to provide it in that way as long as we have access to uh, facilities for small pets. Uh, yeah, so the the first one is called Land of Oz, and that's spelled A-H-S, uh, and that is located at 12599 Jordan Road in Fountain. The other location in Pueblo County is the Pueblo Animal Services, and that is at 4600 Eagle Ridge Boulevard, uh, the north side of Pueblo. And then large animals now are being housed at the Colorado State Fairgrounds. That's correct. It's a, we call it an evacuation center um, until we decide that uh, people need to stay overnight. And at that point, we just change the name to the shelter. We won't change the location. Uh, we'll just add cots and other things. So, but but we don't put the cots in there until we know we need them. So if people are just hanging out there right now, they have nowhere else to go. If it becomes a thing where they're going to continue to be evacuated, they can then spend the night there. Absolutely. That's going to be our plan. And we'll be available to them for as long as uh, there are people evacuated. We'll also have caseworkers available in the next coming days to help people that uh, need some help with recovery. For those people watching at home and hearing what's going on, uh, we're getting a lot of uh, calls and texts about people that want to help. How can people at home help uh, the situation, what's going on, volunteering, bringing food, anything like that? Right now, we have all the assets that we need to provide support, whether it's sheltering or uh, simply as a center to provide information. So uh, from the Red Cross point of view, we're good with that. Uh, I believe the fire departments all have the assets that they need. 
Uh, we've had people come by with uh, cases of water, that sort of thing, uh, but we have ample supplies of that as well. So at this point, we're asking people not to bring things to our uh, center or shelter so that uh, we can make sure we have room for the people that are there. If we have a need, then we'll make that call out through the media to let them know what we need. Any other questions? All right. I wanted to ask one last, could we ask one last question of you? I just wanted to see if, are we doing training tomorrow as well? Is there going to be any halt on training at all? So we'll evaluate that uh, tomorrow. Um, tomorrow really being Saturday, we'll have to take a hard look at it. We went into a check fire this afternoon. Uh, it's really halt training until we can get a good handle on the, the situation here. Um, and then when we took over the incident command from uh, the Hanover uh, Department, um, you know, we're really focused out here right now at this point. Uh, but tomorrow we'll, we'll take a good evaluation. So there is a chance tomorrow we'll still be firing these same drills? Yeah, depending on, really depending on how this uh, turns out here this evening. Okay. I think so. Thank you. you bet. And while Thanks. While we have you up there, actually, uh, can I give you the last title again? I'm so sorry. Yeah, sure. No, uh, my name's Ron Fitch. I'm the garrison commander at Fort Carson. Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. you. All right, you just heard a press conference from Fort Carson, the El Paso County Sheriff, and the Red Cross updating us on the latest on this fire, the Midway, Carson Midway fire. Here's another look at that evacuation map. 250 homes have been evacuated. The boundaries there, Donner Pass View, County Line Road, I-25, and Fort Carson. And we do know that structures have burned, homes have been lost still not clear on a number at this hour. And we did hear from that garrison commander because one of the big questions from a lot of you, as well as from us as reporters, why was Fort Carson training today with red flag warnings across the region given the weather conditions that we have? Their answer was, quote, we have to train, close quote. Regardless of the circumstances, the garrison commander, the Colonel Fitch said, uh, Given that, and given the destruction and devastation that we've seen, families burned out of their homes, uh, the colonel said that they will reassess, they will uh, recoup, and consider whether or not to continue that training exercise tomorrow. Again, as you heard from him, a massive deployment is underway to both Kosovo and Afghanistan. It's a constant training scenario for Fort Carson. But again, this uh, really changes the dynamic. So they are going to try and uh, reassess whether or not this is a smart move moving forward. They did say that today they ended the training once this fire blew up and then they could uh, move the appropriate resources to try and fight the fire. And it sounds like given the weather conditions we're seeing now, they seem pretty confident that the perimeter is at least controlled. Structure protection, they're saying, is basically complete. They're now going to move to actively fight this fire with the resources on hand, and that's a lot, including bringing now in those big tankers to try and drop some slurry and really put a dent in this thing. And the official number of acre, acres right now, 2,100 from Fort Carson, 2,100 acres. They aren't giving us a containment number at this hour, but Sheriff Bill Elder says they are hopeful to have this thing out by midnight. Yeah, he said that uh, they did do a flyover after the fact on some of those burned out areas. He said there was one specific area in the Midway Ranch subdivision that took the brunt of the damage. That's where the vast majority of the homes that were destroyed are located, although he would not venture a guess as to how many have been destroyed, but it is several. And again, they won't put a number on it, but he said, and as we've been documenting for hours here on News 5, a very large fire perimeter. But again, the good news is it looks like the weather is going to cooperate a little better. The winds are dying down, humidity is going up. And so they think that at least at this point, structure protection, they can move now to actually suppressing this fire. Yeah, and we have a lot of video to show you if we can show some of that video of this. We actually have our Bill Folsom. He's been out there all afternoon where we've seen the smoke, the haze, the winds. Bill, what's it like right now? Boy, what a difference a few minutes make or, you know, last 20 minutes. We've gone down to barely even a breeze to earlier when that wind was just cranking. 
and we were watching flames just move across at multiple miles an hour faster than anybody could keep up with them. You heard Sheriff Bill Elder say that they're going to get on top of this, and after seeing what happened earlier, you had to wonder if that was true. But what we're seeing right now, it is definitely doable. If you look over, you can see one of the Chinooks just taking off, filling up. This is now, uh, they now have a second Chinook out here, and they're rotating in and out every couple of minutes going in and getting hot spots. The other big telltale out here is if you look at the smoke and what is going on with it, it is much smaller. It is also billowing now, just kind of drifting along, whereas earlier it was laying down against the ground, and we could just see it whipping away and uh, we also saw big black plumes coming out of it now it is mostly just kind of a grayish with a little bit of black going on black is always a bad sign it means it's moving and getting into new burnable uh, combustible material oftentimes when you see the white that means it's uh, going into grasses and just kind of leftover things that are burning we did have seen multiple planes circling over the top getting kind of a, a pulse of what's going on here they are really going to try and take advantage. The sun is just about to go down, so they really want to take advantage of this next 30, 40 minutes while they've still got some light, but conditions are calm. So a lot of activity going on, but looking up, way up from what it was just an hour ago. Watching out for you, El Paso County, Bill Folsom, News 5. Bill, thank you. And once again, there is an evacuation center set up and they will have cots available for evacuees if necessary tonight at the Fountain Valley Baptist Church in Fountain. And uh, also those large animals can go to the state fairgrounds. There's two places for small animals now, Land of Oz, AHS, on Jordan Road in Fountain. So that's probably a little closer to right. that center where the evacuees can go. Also, Pueblo Animal Services on Eagle Ridge in North Pueblo. We'll be right back.
Carson, uh, grass fire got some improving news as far as the weather is concerned, and it sounds like structure protection has been set aside, weather conditions improving, they can now attack those areas where the fire is still active. Yeah, we just heard from officials for the first time today. Sam Kramer is live there where this press conference just wrapped up. Sam, give us the latest. Yeah, Rob Elizabeth, I mean, we just heard it, 2,100 acres, that's the official size. They don't have a number of percentage containment, but just based on the mood from those officials that we heard from, they have a much better feeling now than they did even just an hour or two ago, and a lot, a lot of that has to do with the wind. As Bill just touched on a little bit ago, it has really calmed down here in the situation. Um, so, you know, they have a kind of an optimistic deadline of really getting this under wraps later tonight uh, and you know they have the resources on hand to do that so uh, we'll have to see what can happen no really word on when these evacuations will be lifted or some sort but uh, you know it's just interesting to hear that um, Colonel Fitch who's the garrison commander at Fort Carson said today they did ha they did hold fire after this fire actually began fire meaning training operations he couldn't commit to whether or not they would hold that tomorrow again as Rob you've been talking about all day they do have deployments it's an active deployment year so it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out, but uh, again, they are really shifting their focus away from structure protection. They feel that the work they already have done today, uh, again, they did lose some structures, but the work they have done today is sufficient. Now they can focus on fighting the main body of the fire now that those winds are died down, and this fire, again, is already consumed 2,100 acres. The thought now is that they can squash it in the few spots uh, that remain hot. Again, the smoke, I'm looking over at it now, smoke is hardly crawling at this hour, uh, very different from even just two hours ago. So a much calmer scene right now. We'll continue to keep you updated as we learn those updates. Always watching out for you, El Paso County, Sam Kramer, News 5. Sam, thanks. I wanted to pick up one point that we did here during that news conference from the garrison commander talking about uh, uh, culpability or responsibility on the part of Fort Carson. And he said in that reassess and recoup statement that he made, he was hinting at the fact that they were going to possibly pursue financial assistance in some way, shape, or form to try and help those folks who've been either burned out of their home or sustained some kind of damage. You didn't really get an opportunity to finish that thought, mm -hmm. but it sounds like at least Fort Carson now is thinking about some aspect of assisting these folks financially from wherever that might come from as they try to rebuild because obviously uh, some folks have lost everything today. Right, and as of now, some may not even know that right. their homes have been burned by this and affected by this. There is an evacuation center set up right now. That's where we find News 5's Jessica Barreto live. She's been talking with evacuees all day. It is such an emotional day for them. It is, and part of the help that the Red Cross is providing for these families is food. And as you can see, there's pizza here, there's juice, there's Girl Scout cookies, water. Most of these are actually donations. And of course, these families are going through a very tough time. They've had a very long day. The Red Cross just trying to do what they can through these evacuation centers. And as was mentioned in the press conference, the Red Cross will open this location as a shelter to whoever needs it and will provide cots and a toiletry kit uh, as, as provided uh, as necessary, as I mentioned. So uh, always watching out for you in Fountain, Jessica Bredo, News 5. I wanted to reiterate what Bill Fortune from the Red Cross said, that they do have ample supplies right now, so they don't need anything for the time being. And as uh, Jessica mentioned, it's a center now. It may transition to an evacuation shelter if need be, if, they, when, if and when they determine how many people may actually want to use that. They'll bring in cots and be able to deal right. with that situation. These 250 homes, they are still evacuated. No one is allowed back in, so don't even try right now. Just stay far away from that area. Yeah, generally, they wait to see if they can find family or friends to stay with. And then right. last resort, they have that option. And then, obviously, the Red Cross can uh, accommodate them. Let's get a check. Quick check on the weather with lead forecaster Mike Daniels. For Thank you, Elizabeth and Rob. Yes, that pressure gradient has greatly relaxed at the surface. Winds have died off. That's the best news we could hope for. And the winds will stay calm throughout the night. This is your wind forecast. 8 o'clock, just a light breeze or calm conditions. As we work through the overnight hours, those winds will continue to lay down nicely. Early tomorrow morning, calm conditions across our area. We're going to see those winds start to ramp up a little during the afternoon. They'll be out of the south tomorrow afternoon, 10 to 15, up to 20 miles per hour at times. Got an extended forecast. I think you'll like to see because we finally got some moisture in it. Sunday afternoon rain and then Sunday night rain changing to snow could have issues with blowing snow across far northern El Paso County Sunday night. We'll stay on top of that and keep you updated. Give you the first alert here on News 5. 
Big time cool down on the way by Monday, only 43 degrees. And in Pueblo, there's a slight chance you're going to see some moisture late Sunday into early Monday morning. My big problem with this system will have a strong north wind blowing down the Palmer Divide that shuts off rainfall, snowfall pr uh, production between downtown Colorado Springs and Pueblo. So again, developing situation. We'll watch it closely and keep you updated throughout the weekend. Guys. Again, thank you for joining us for this 6 o'clock newscast. The latest numbers, 2,100 acres have burned with the Carson Midway fire. They're going to be working throughout the evening, hoping to have things contained by around midnight, they right. say. And as we get new information, if need be, we will break into programming. Otherwise, we will update the latest information at the bottom of the screen. Have a full update at 10 o'clock, hoping for the best. The weather will cooperate, but again, stay with News 5 and the News 5 app.